In this section, we'll see how to convert uh, the central force problem, which we've already converted into a two-dimensional problem. We're going to see how to convert that into a one-dimensional problem. Okay, recall we can write the system's angular momentum uh, as mu r squared v dot, that's L. And so that means that we can make the replacement, whenever we see phi dot, we can replace that with L, the angular momentum of system, which is, the, which is a constant, divided by mu uh, r squared. And so we can come back to our uh, dynamical equation for r, so mu r double dot is equal to mu r phi dot squared minus uh, the partial uh, with respect to r of the potential energy function. Well, we can replace this with this, and so we get uh, that uh, mu r double dot is equal to L squared over mu squared r cubed minus partial uh, with respect to r of the potential energy. This uh, L squared over mu squared r cubed, that is in fact the centrifugal force. Remember that wants to drive the two particles apart as they're re uh, revolving around one another. So that represents a force that acts outward pushes the particles apart from one another, tries to increase r. Well, you can see very easily that this expression here, we can actually write that as the negative partial der derivative with respect to r of this function. And so then we can write mu r double dot uh, as just negative uh, partial with respect to r of all of this in here. So here's our original uh, potential energy function, and now this is extra term which uh, is related to the centrifugal force. It's essentially a centrifugal potential. And so we can define a new effective potential for the system, u effective, uh, as the sum of these two things, L squared over 2 mu r squared, plus the original potential energy function. And so we'll see that as far as the dynamics is concerned, uh, the system has this new effective potential. This term, as I said, wants to drive uh, the particles away from one another, very often this term uh, will want to pull the two particles together. So let's look at a specific example of that. As an example, let's consider the gravitational potential energy that's shown here. And here's again our centrifugal potential energy, which is a positive number. Now the centrifugal potential energy uh, is always positive, but drops off very rapidly as r goes to infinity. You can see that here is this blue curve where I'm plotting all the potentials. And as r goes to zero, however, uh, the centrifugal uh, potential uh, shoots toward infinity. The gravitational potential energy, on the other hand, is negative everywhere uh, and approaches zero as r goes to infinity, as does the centrifugal potential, but it, but it approaches zero much more slowly since this goes as one over r where the centrifugal potential goes as 1 over r squared. As you approach r equals 0, however, the gravitational potential energy becomes negative uh, and heads toward negative infinity, but more slowly than the centrifugal potential increases as you go toward r equals 0. And so the upshot of all of this is that my effective potential energy, uh, shown here in black, uh, approaches 0 for r going to infinity uh, there's some minimum value as r gets small down here somewhere, and then it shoots way up as r goes to uh, goes to zero. And so essentially what happens is you have a particle with a, f a finite energy that will be trapped somewhere. It can't possibly uh, approach uh, r equals zero. The centrifugal potential will keep it from getting uh, close to r equals zero. In other words, it'll keep the two particles from crashing into one another. Um, but it drops off as you go farther and farther away from the origin. And so that's the behavior of the effective potential energy. It keeps the two particles from ever approaching uh, arbitrarily close, uh, and that's the a result of the centrifugal uh, potential. It, that's required by conservation of angular momentum, because remember, the angular momentum uh, is related to r squared, so r can never go to zero without making the, the mo angular momentum go to zero. So in order to keep a finite angular momentum r must be prevented from going to zero. So coming back to our dynamical equation for r double dot, it's given by this. Remember this is an effective potential that includes both the standard potential energy and the centrifugal potential. If we multiply both sides through by r dot, as shown here, 
Then the left-hand side, you can see that becomes the total time derivative of one-half mu r dot squared, so that's just the, the system's kinetic energy. The right-hand side, well, that's just uh, the partial derivative with respect to r times r dot. Well, because the effective potential only depends on r, we can trade this partial derivative for a total derivative, and so what we get on the right-hand side is minus the total r derivative of the effective potential times uh, dr by dt, and of course that uh, is just using the chain rule, just the negative time derivative of the effective potential energy. So if I take this right-hand side here and put it over on the left-hand side, what we see is that this whole thing can be written as the time derivative of the kinetic energy plus an effective potential energy. Uh, and as the book shows, this represents the total energy of the system. And so in other words, the total energy of the system, which is this sum here, uh, that time derivative is equal to zero. Therefore, the total energy of the system is a constant. And as we'll show in a second, the conservation of total energy for the system actually allows us to analyze the dynamics, uh, at least put bounds uh, on the orbit for these two particles, uh, given a, a certain initial energy. Okay, so here's a plot uh, showing the effective potential energy as a function of the radial distance between our two particles, R. Okay, and so as, as we showed before, that effective potential energy shoots to infinity as R goes to zero, uh, and then approaches, then becomes negative at some point, and then approaches uh, zero from the bottom as R goes to infinity. Okay, so let's imagine we have a system where the total energy of the system at some point uh, is greater than zero. So it's some fixed value here. So this is E greater than zero. We can see that for those two particles, the closest the two particles can ever get radially from one another is given by the point at which the total energy crosses over the effective potential. So that represents the minimum radial distance that the two particles can ever get uh, from one another. In order to get closer than that, they'd have to have a larger uh, initial energy in order to overcome this enormous uh, potential energy barrier. So essentially, they'd have to move uphill um, to get over this minimum uh, approach distance. And so this represents an orbit for two particles in a central force. This is an orbit that is unbounded. They can't get closer than R min, but you can see there's nothing to prevent them from going out to R uh, equal... Uh, infinity, so, so they can get as far apart as they like. And so this represents an unbounded orbit. Unbounded orbit. And that's true when the total energy of the system, the kinetic plus the potential energy, is greater than zero. What about a case where the potential energy, excuse me, where the total energy is less than zero? Well, if the total energy of the system is less than zero, so the energy will lie down here somewhere. So this is an energy which is less than zero. In this case, this represents a bounded orbit. This, if you have two particles that are in here somewhere, the closest they can ever get to one another is given by this R min. That's, again, where the initial energy crosses over the effective potential energy. But the farthest they can ever get is over here. That's R max. So as these two particles orbit around one another, the closest they can get is here, the farthest they can get is here, so that means this is a bounded orbit. And so that's always true, you always have a bounded orbit when the total energy of the system is less than zero. And then we can imagine a case where the total energy of the system was exactly equal to zero, and there you can actually go all the way out to infinity but then there's a minimum uh, approach distance you can have uh, as well. So that's a case of an orbit which is just unbounded. It can just make it all the way out to infinity, uh, but it can't ever approach closer than some minimum value, which again is enforced by the centrifugal potential.